Hello and welcome to Medical Aid in Dying Across the State, Part 2. Thank you so much for joining us today. Compassion and Choices is the nation's oldest, largest, and most active nonprofit working to improve care, expand options, and empower everyone to chart their end of life journey. I want to take a moment and dedicate today's webinar to everyone who has helped us in this incredibly important work that we do from Brittany Menard to our volunteers, donors, and staff across the country. We couldn't do this work without you, so thank you. Today, we will be hearing from Tom Whaley, whose wife struggled to use medical aid in dying in California after the law was passed. Jess Pesley, our staff attorney, who will talk about our work to protect medical aid in dying laws. And finally, Senator Bill Monning, who will talk about the End of Life Option Act in California. What we'll cover today. One of the things I love most about Compassion and Choices is that we don't just work to pass laws. We actually stick around and do the work of implementation so that people who are eligible can access them. We have over 20 years experience doing this and we could do a whole 12 week course on access and implementation. However, we are gonna to try to hit the highlights of implementation that we have learned from access and implementation from New Jersey to DC to Colorado. And we wanna have plenty of time for questions because we wanna be able to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. To ask a question, you'll see a box like this in, on your screen and you can type your question anytime. And we will get to as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. If you missed part one of this webinar series, that's okay. You didn't need to watch it to join us today. Um, however, you can watch part one on our website if you missed it after today's webinar. So what exactly are we talking about when we use the term medical aid in dying? Well, medical aid in dying is one of many end of life options. It is a medical practice in which a terminally ill, mentally capable adult with a prognosis of six months or less to live can have the option for medication that they can decide to self-ingest to bring about a peaceful death. Medical aid in dying does not cause more people to die, but it does allow fewer people to suffer. Poll question time. If you were terminally ill, would you want the option of medical aid in dying? Take a minute to click on your answer, and we'll show the answers in a moment. Medical aid in dying is authorized in 10 U.S. jurisdictions, including Oregon, Washington, Vermont, Montana, California, Colorado, the District of Columbia, Hawaii, New Jersey, and Maine with legislation pending throughout the country. You can see on this map, the light blue states are where medical aid in dying is authorized. The dark blue states are where we have legislation pending in states this year. And the yellow boxes is where we have active volunteer teams. 70% of people across demographic, age, political preference, and religion support the option of medical aid in dying. I think this is huge in a world where there's so much political polarization. This is an issue that the majority of people support. We have nearly 50 years of combined practice across the currently authorized jurisdiction. And we know that there has never been a single instance of coercion, abuse, or misuse of the law, not once. We know from the data across the country that nearly one third of patients who go through the entire process and receive a prescription for medical aid in dying, never actually use it. Just having it on hand gives them a huge sense of relief. I met a man in Hawaii who said he never felt more alive than the moment he got his medical aid in dying, his medication. And he said it sounded crazy, but he finally didn't have to worry about what his end of life experience would be because he had that medication and he could finally enjoy the last few weeks of his life without that stress and worry. And he said he hoped he didn't even ever have to use it, but just having it gave him a huge sense of relief. We hear stories like this over and over again. Um, all right, let's see those poll results. 
Yes, 95% of you said yes. Um, thank you. All right, let's get to the nitty gritty. Imagine that you live in a state that has just authorized medical aid in dying. What happens next? Well, there are fundamental eligibility requirements. In order to access the law, you need to be an adult, 18 years or older, terminally ill with a prognosis of six months or less to live, mentally capable of making your own healthcare decisions, acting voluntarily and able to self-ingest the medication. So if you meet all these requirements, you can call up your doctor and pick up the prescription later that day. No, this is not how it works, but so many people think this is how it works and it is not that way at all. It is very complicated. Um, in fact, there is a 13 step process that a person has to go through to obtain a prescription for medical aid in dying. And it's, it's why we're having this webinar today um, and why we do the access and implementation work that we do. So thank you for tuning in because it's really important to learn about this. So as you can see here in this condensed picture of the 13 plus step process that a dying person has to go through to access the law, um, it's, it's complicated. I will give you the cliff notes on this process to help you understand why our implementation work is so important. First of all, you need to find two different physicians willing to support you. There's generally one main physician who will write the prescription if you qualify and a second physician who will confirm your eligibility. You have to make two verbal requests to the main physician separated by a mandatory minimum waiting period. This doctor has a laundry list of requirements and paperwork you must go through to qualify. Now, don't get me wrong. We absolutely need core safeguards. But we now know that all of those steps are not necessary to protect patients, and many eligible patients are not able to access the law because of additional requirements. That's why in authorized states, we have what we call the access campaign to help ensure eligible patients can access the law. So how do doctors find out about the 13-step process required to support their patients? How does the public even know that medical aid in dying is an option for them? Our access campaign starts the moment a law passes and includes structural, uh, medical, and public outreach. It's generally up to a state's Department of Health to implement and coordinate the paperwork that doctors turn in. We have had the privilege of working with state health departments to best implement laws from Hawaii to the District of Columbia. This is a picture of a yearly course that we put on in partnership with DC Health to give continuing education credits for nurses, social workers, and physicians about DC's medical aid and dying law. We also work with healthcare systems and hospices. When a state authorizes, Healthcare systems and hospices have to decide what their internal policy will be. Will they allow their doctors to write prescriptions for qualified patients? Will they allow their doctors to act as the second physician? Our medical outreach team offers free technical advice and policies tailored around a state's unique law. We also work with health, healthcare systems and hospices to implement their policies. We offer free clinical consultations by experienced physicians, peer-to-peer -peer webinars, and in-services. This is a picture from last year's End of Life Symposium at the City of Hope uh, in California, where they, they put on continuing education credits for medical providers about end-of-life options, including medical aid and dying. Here you can see some policies from around the country. Having a good internal medical aid and dying policy is absolutely crucial for making sure a patient who's eligible can access this option. When New Jersey's law passed, I got a call from Seasons Hospice. Seasons is a national hospice and they are fully committed to patient-directed care. And they wanted to know if New Jersey's law was like California's law because they wanted to make sure that they were ready on day one when New Jersey's law went into effect so that they could support patients. They wanted to make sure that their staff was trained and that they had the right policies and procedures to support um, patients in this option. Now, let me tell you that is extremely rare. 
Um, most of the time we reach out to hospices and try to work with them to adopt um, policies that let their medical directors practice and let their staff be present so they can be there if a patient wants when they take medical aid in dying. This is a picture of our national medical director, Dr. David Grube, who travels the country to mentor and train physicians, nurses, and social workers in the clinical practices of medical aid in dying. Once physicians become experienced with medical aid in dying, we support them in further mentoring and training other local physicians, so more physicians feel comfortable supporting eligible patients in the option. Medical aid in dying is an accepted clinical practice and part of the continuum of end-of-life care, so there is no special certification needed. We also have a doc-to-doc -doc free confidential consultation line that physicians can call to learn about all end-of-life options. I've heard from doctors that, you know, any doctor can follow the steps to support a patient in medical aid in dying, but that it's really nice to have someone that they can talk to who's experienced, who's prescribed medical aid in dying before in an informal and confidential way. So we encourage our volunteers and supporters to share this resource with their doctors so that their doctors can call if they're interested. We also have a pharmacist to pharmacist consultation service um, so that pharmacists can keep up to date with the latest aid in dying medications and be prepared to fill prescriptions and counsel patients. This is Jake Blechta, a pharmacist in Hawaii who we work with. Finally, public outreach is so important and our volunteers make all the difference. We could not do this work without our volunteers. Prior to authorization, many states have worked to lay this foundation for implementation and access. This volunteer work continues after authorization. For example, in Colorado, which you can see pictured in the bottom left-hand corner, that was a, a screenshot taken just yesterday by Colorado State, um, one of the Colorado State staff, Sam DeWitt, um, they have an active volunteer group of retired healthcare professionals who proactively seek system policy change, act as a sounding board for physicians interested in prescribing for patients, and as ambassadors for the movement as a whole. We also count on volunteers to do public outreach presentations about the law to local groups like Rotary Clubs, have booths to share our resources and let people know that medical aid in dying is an option in their state. When we have the resources, thanks to our incredible donors, we launch public service announcements, which we have done in DC, Hawaii, and other states. Here is a recent 30-second PSA by Dolores Horta for California. Um, you can watch it on our YouTube channel or on our California page. And I'm not gonna show it because I wanna get to as many questions as we can. As many of you may know, storytelling helps pass medical aid in dying laws, and it also helps to implement them. Using terms like medical aid in dying can sound wonky and distant. But when you hear about someone's personal story on the issue, it makes a lot more sense. Here's a story about a New Jersey physician, Dr. Israel, who had long been glad New Jersey didn't allow medical aid in dying. So she had an easy excuse for her patients. Can't help you, not authorized here. But when New Jersey authorized medical aid in dying, Dr. Israel was out of excuses. And when a patient who was eligible came to her, she decided to support this patient. Afterward, she was so glad that New Jersey had authorized medical aid in dying so patients could have this option. She realized how important it was to have this option. Compassion and Choices has a fabulous communications team that can help get important stories like this one place. This is another favorite story of mine. Um, it's about a Catholic doctor in Hawaii who is totally against medical aid in dying. And when Hawaii passed their law, he had an eligible patient come to him and tell him that she wanted him to prescribe the medication for her, for her. After prayer and much contemplation, he decided to support this patient. And he actually attended her medical aid and dying death on Easter Sunday last year. And it was such an incredibly moving experience for him that he changed his complete attitude about medical aid and dying and now advocates for eligible patients to have this option. 
He even says that on his drive home from her death that he felt God tell him he had done the right thing. We also have a fabulous storyteller manager at Compassion and Choices. So if you are interested in sharing your story, she can work with you to capture it. Just go to our website and you can fill out the online form there to share your story. All right, another poll question. Have you asked your doctor if they would prescribe medical aid in dying for you if you qualified for it? So take a minute and let us know, have you talked to your doctor about medical aid in dying? And while you answer that, um, I just wanna let everybody know we have a plethora of useful tools and resources on our state-specific website, on our state-specific web pages. So if you go to compassionandchoices.org slash type in your, st your state, you can find out all kinds of information that's specific for your state, whether your state has authorized or not. Um, all right, let's see those poll results, please. Yes, not yet, no, not applicable. Looks like we're all over the place. So one of the reasons I, I pose that question is because you know a lot of doctors don't even think about medical aid and dying until someone talks to them about it. So we really encourage everyone, even if you're not in an authorized state, to talk to your doctor today. And if you are in, in an authorized state, be very direct. If this is an option you think you may want down the line, Ask your doctor if they would write the prescription for you if you qualified, so you know up front if this doctor would support you or not in that option. Barriers and roadblocks. Um, so we do a lot of work to try to ensure that all eligible terminally ill patients can access the law, but we are not always successful, and we hear a lot of really difficult, heartbreaking stories in our authorized state. Uh, so now we're going to talk about major barriers and roadblocks. Um, and I've invited Tom Whaley here. He's going to talk about what he and his wife went through for Christine to access California's medical aid and dying law. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to you, Tom. Hi, my name is Tom Whaley. Um, let me give you a quick little bit of background about my experience with my late wife, Christine. Um, September 2012, she discovered... Um, she was a stage two malignant melanoma. Um, so we went from being, as you saw in the picture right there, we were a very active couple. We would go backpacking, hiking, uh, adventuring. That picture was taken at the Grand Canyon during a, uh, a ringing eclipse. Um, so we were active, and, and but here we get this diagnosis that's pretty bad. Um, but Christine had a lot of spirit and spunk, and so she decided she wanted to fight right? Fight hard. And so for the next six years, almost six years, um, more surgeries than I can count, more treatments than I can count, quite a few of them experimental treatments um, to see if things would work. Went through so many trials with the help of various doctors and people. Um, and Christine found a doctor that she really liked. He was a very no-nonsense, straight scientific kind of guy. Um, and she liked the way he dealt with her disease and he worked with her and he treated her. Um, and she had a, a good relationship with him. Um, and things kept progressing though, and things kept getting worse. Went through gamma knife treatments, which were really intense. Um, it's hard for me to even think about some of the things she went through now. It, it, it just, it, it took a lot of strength to do the fighting that she did to fight against the disease. But over time, it just wore her down and down. And I remember um, during this time that California passed the medical aid in dying, and, and she, she thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. Um, but then we didn't pay too much attention at that point. 2016 goes around, and she started talking a little bit about it a little more, because um, she, she knew the death that her grandparents had both gone through. Her, her grandmother had breast cancer and died from that and had a very painful, slow death. And Christine thought about the kind of death she wanted and she realized, oh, wait, what's this? I, I want to check this out. And then things kept progressing, things kept progressing. And I know in the spring of 2018, it, it got really serious. Um, we didn't have much time left, so we started talking about it a little more seriously. And at that point, we went. To, she went to her doctor, and her doctor was against it. And this was a total surprise to us. We were not expecting this. Like, what do you do when the doctor you've worked with for almost six years suddenly says, no, I'm not going to help you with that. 
Um, it's not something that I will do. Um, it was like a shock to our system. So she started reaching out to trying to talk to local hospices. And there was a lot of resistance in our community about even talking about it. Um, people didn't know who to point her to. People didn't know who, who supported it, who didn't. Um, and during this whole six years that she was doing this, her, her doctor's practice had actually been absorbed by a, a, um, a religious hospital. And so everyone within the network, within our local community, had some kind of affiliation with that hospital. And all of them were scared to even broach the topic for fear of losing access to the hospital where they got most of their money. Um, this caused us in our small community, we live in a smaller area, to not like, where do we go at this point when your own doctors won't talk about it? Your local doctors, you can't find out who's in support of it. Like, it's legal, it's, it's perfectly legal, yet we couldn't figure out where to go. Um, luckily, we got, lots of different phone calls, um, lots of different people talking, and we finally figured out that we could go to UCLA since we had a connection there, and UCLA was able to help Christine overcome the barriers. Um, but even that was very, very crazy. We had, to, it's about a three and a half hour drive for, from us to UCLA, and we had to go multiple times, like the waiting period, um, in person, because it requires to be verbal, with multiple doctors. And you can imagine traveling when you're extremely weak, You've gone through trial, uh, experimental treatments, um, immunotherapies, and you, you're on your deathbed, yet you have to travel all this distance just to verbally tell a doctor you need to do something multiple times, and that's the only reason you need to go. Um, it was a huge hurdle for us, and it was quite scary because she was getting weaker and closer and closer. Um, in the middle of all that, there were some lawsuits going on, and suddenly... After she had been had her first verbal, between that and the second, uh, it, the law was invalidated for a short period of time. Luckily, it was a short period of time, um, and we were able to continue the process. And then um, August 2018, Christine chose to take her medical aid and dying medication. Um, it sounds like a sad day, but it was actually a very peaceful, kind day. Um, Christine went the way she wanted to go. She had the death that she had hoped to have. It was peaceful. It was laid out the way she wanted. It was the right time for her to end her suffering and move on. Um, I'm very thankful that Compassion Choice was there to help guide that and help spread the news. Um, but all these hurdles are in place that make it hard, like talking to your doctor, finding another doctor when your doctor doesn't. All this at the last minute causes huge amount of fear and worry in Christine. And, um, Thankfully, though, she was able to find a way around it with the help of many people and make it through this. Um, but it wasn't an easy process, and it was actually quite traumatic. Um, but the end result was good for Christine and, and for me. So I'm here to tell her story and just show what it can be like. So thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, when Christine had problems accessing the law, she actually reached out to her state senator, who is actually Bill Monning, who's on the call with us today. Um, and after her experience, she wrote a really compelling op-ed in the San Luis Obispo Tribune because she didn't want anyone else to have to go through what she did to be able to access the option. And I'm grateful that she was able to have the end of life experience she wanted, but we do hear stories in authorized states of people who are not able to access it. And it's, it's just so heartbreaking. And it's, it's the reason we do the work that we do. Um, I'm gonna go over the major roadblocks. I think Christine's story really, um, it really exemplifies the main roadblocks that a lot of people hit in authorized states and why access and implement, implementation is so important. Let me pull up the, the slides again quickly. Let's see, there we go. So as Tom said, one of the biggest hurdles is that there are a lot of healthcare systems that prohibit physicians from practicing medical aid and dying. Now, any doctor can, has the right to say, no, I don't want to support you. However, there are healthcare systems and hospices that will tell doctors who want to support a patient that they can't. Now, in California, 97% of religious hospitals do not allow physicians to practice. Most of them are Catholic, and it's because of the U.S. bishops' ethical and religious doctrine. And 
And I just wanna remind everybody that the majority of Catholics poll the same as everybody else. The majority of Catholics actually want the option of medical aid and dying, but where you go to receive your healthcare is really important um, because if you go to, to certain places, a doctor may not be allowed to support you in your end of life option. Finding two physicians can also be difficult. Um, you know, even if you go to a healthcare system that lets doctors practice, if you happen to have a doctor who says no and they don't refer you to another doctor who will support you, you could fall through the cracks and it can be very difficult. It's hard to find a doctor when you're healthy and it's so much more difficult when you're sick. So finding two physicians is often very difficult. The mandatory minimum waiting period. A Kaiser Southern California story, study excuse me, found that a third of eligible patients who otherwise would have qualified for medical aid in dying did not survive the mandatory minimum waiting period. Now, even if they do survive it, it can be very stressful and anxiety ridden to get through that time frame. So most mandatory minimum waiting periods are between 15 and 20 days. This is a picture of Dr. Omega Silva. She was an incredible woman, a physician, an advocate, and a very good friend to Compassion and Choices. She wanted the option of medical aid in dying, and the mandatory waiting period was excruciating for her. She would have taken the medication earlier if she had been able to. She called um, Donna, our, our DC staff, uh, almost every day just in tears because she, she wanted her medication, but she had to wait through this mandatory minimum waiting period. Thankfully, Dr. Silva survived that period and was able to have the end of life that she wanted. But again, she would have taken the medication earlier if she had been able to. A lot of states are starting to amend their laws. So in Oregon, we supported a bill last year that actually passed and is now law in Oregon. So if the main physician um, believes that their patient will not survive the mandatory waiting period, they can waive it in Oregon. Uh, and we're trying to make this amendment in a few other states too. So this is a picture from Hawaii. In Hawaii this year, there was a bill that was going to allow nurse practitioners who have prescriptive authority, the ability to write prescriptions for medical aid and dying for qualified patients. Hawaii actually has a growing um, physician shortage. And so nurse practitioners have, have a lot of authority to write prescriptions for controlled substances. Um, and there was also a bill in Washington that would have made it easier for patients to know what healthcare systems and hospices, what medical aid and dying policies they have. Um, because of the pandemic, a lot of this legislation was not able to go through, but we are still working and doing our best to make sure that eligible patients can access the law. Protecting the law. Now I'm going to hand it over to Jess Pesley, who is going to talk about our important work of, of protecting medical aid and dying laws. Jess? All right. Thank you, Sam. Um, so yeah, I'm here today to talk about how lawsuits can affect access to medical aid and dying. Um, the passage of a medical aid and dying law is often just the first step in ensuring that patients can actually access the law. Um, once a law is passed, our opponents often immediately file a lawsuit attempting to overturn the law um, and to um, immediately prevent terminally ill patients from accessing the law. Our opponents also typically ask for preliminary injunctions, which, if granted, um, blocks access to medical aid and dying while the lawsuit is pending. And as many of you probably know, lawsuits can take many, many years um, to work their way through the courts. So a successful preliminary injunction really has the potential to um, irrevocably harm terminally ill patients and deny some, you know, any sort of relief, even if the opponents ultimately lose their case. Um, these types of legal challenges are nothing new. In Oregon, uh, medical aid and dying was passed back in 1994. But the law did not go into effect until 1997 because of a lawsuit. And after surviving its first court challenge, it faced another um, that went all the way up to the Supreme Court in 2006. So it took 12 years until all of the litigation concluded, and we still remain vigilant um, against attacks both in Oregon and also all other authorized jurisdictions. Through our litigation, Compassion and Choices works to ensure continued access to medical aid and dying. 
and defends against any attempt to even temporarily bar patient access to the law. Next slide, please. All right, so I wanna talk about two recent examples of lawsuits filed by our opponents to block medical aid and dying laws. Um, the first case is on v. Hestron out of California, and here you can see our legal team in front of the um, California Court of Appeals. On June 8th, 2016, just one day before the California End of Life Options Act was set to go into effect, six doctors opposed to medical aid in dying filed a complaint in Riverside Superior Court in an attempt to overturn the law. Um, they brought a number of constitutional claims, um, including that it violated equal protection and due process, but also that the law was passed outside the scope of the special legislative session. Um, our opponents did apply for a preliminary injunction, and thankfully it was denied by the court. Um, but however, as Tom mentioned, in May 2018, access to the law was briefly blocked when a judge ruled that the law was unconstitutionally passed. Uh, one month later, in June 2018, Compassion Choices successfully appealed that ruling and effectively reinstated the law. Um, Compassion and Choices has since intervened in the lawsuit, representing two terminally ill patients and one physician in support of medical aid and dying. And earlier this year, Compassion and Choices had a victory um, when a judge ruled that the, the law was in fact passed constitutionally and that the plaintiffs lacked standing. Um, but that does not mean that the case is over, unfortunately. Plaintiffs can still amend their complaint to fix the standing issue, um, and there's always the chance of appeal. So while litigation has been ongoing since 2016, we have fought not only to defend the law overall, but also to ensure that Californians can access the law while the lawsuit is pending. Next slide, please. All right, so the second lawsuit I wanna talk about today is Glassman v. Gruel out of New Jersey. New Jersey's Medical Aid in Dying for the Terminally Ill Act took effect on August 1st, 2019. And opponents filed a lawsuit just one week later challenging the law's constitutionality. Um, the lawsuit was originally brought by a doctor who opposed the law on religious grounds. Um, two other plaintiffs have since joined the case. A pharmacist and a terminally ill patient who opposed the law for either religious or personal reasons. On August 14th, um, the first day that terminally ill patients would have been able to obtain a prescription under the law, a Mercer County judge temporarily suspended the law, blocking patients from accessing medical aid and dying. Thankfully, this order was overturned by the New Jersey Appellate Court just two weeks later on August 29th, um, restoring access to the law. And in a very um, exciting victory for patients' rights, our opponents' claims were dismissed with prejudice just last month on April 1st. But again, that doesn't mean this case is over. Um, there's a motion for reconsideration hearing just tomorrow morning, actually, and there's still the possibility for an appeal. Compassion and Choices is closely monitoring this case to ensure that New Jerseyans can access um, their state's medical aid and dying laws. And while our opponents will likely always try to block access to medical aid in dying, and these lawsuits have the potential to be incredibly disruptive and delay access, Compassion and Choices is ready to defend these laws in court to ensure that qualifying patients can access medical aid in dying. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jess. Uh, All righty, how you can help. We cannot do this work without you. And I, you know, I know we're talking about our work so much today because we do so much, but we, it's, it's dependent on our volunteers and our donors. Um, if you go to our website, you can see our volunteer resource center and you can volunteer in whatever state you're in. And there's so much work that needs to be done and so many different opportunities for volunteer work. So please check it out. And if you have time and are interested, um, please volunteer for us. And if you already do, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, right now, I am very excited to let you know that all donations will be matched one to one. And um, again, we, we rely on individual donations to be able to do the work we do across the country. So if you're able to donate $50 today, that means $100 for us to continue our work. So if you have the capacity, we are grateful for every dollar that we receive from donors, so thank you. And with that, I am very excited to hand it over to Senator Bill Monning. 
Senator Monning is a California state senator. He was one of the co-sponsors for California's medical aid and dying law in 2015, the California End of Life Option Act. He does a lot of great work. And so without further ado, I am handing it over to you, Senator Monning. Well, thank you, Sam. And um, good afternoon, good evening to all who are participating. I appreciate this opportunity to check in. I always learn something new when I listen to Compassion and Choices. I think as a starting point, um, the bill we passed in California was historic for California, but a lot of that was based on following the success in Oregon and efforts in other states. There's been a, a really valuable coalition of activists of compassion and choices, medical community, uh, and others. And I think we expected, uh, efforts had failed in California about 10 years earlier. We introduced the bill in 2015 and thought it would be a two-year project at least. And because of a very powerful coalition and the participation of of physicians, of terminally ill patients, uh, we were able to win the necessary votes in both the Senate and the Assembly, and then secured the signature of then Governor Jerry Brown, who wrote a very compassionate and passionate um, supportive statement at the time of signing. As you've heard, there are many safeguards um, that were necessary and we felt important um, to pass and implement this legislation in California. But through practice and experience, we've learned that some of those safeguards have in fact presented hurdles. And we heard that um, very compelling story from Tom Whaley and about his wife, Christine. And I really appreciate Tom's continued participation and sharing Christine's and his story uh, because it, it captures the challenge that many face in their most fragile last days of life of then facing bureaucratic challenges to find a doctor, to find um, the hospital, to find the resources. Compassion and Choices provides that backup and support. And so sharing their contact numbers can be critical, particularly to people who are in more remote areas or maybe have only religious hospitals. Again, our law in California does not mandate anybody to pursue um, an aid in dying prescription. It doesn't mandate any physician to have to participate, but it's patient focused respecting the fundamental human right of a terminally ill patient to pursue a compassionate transition, not just for themselves, but for their loved ones. We hear stories from Brittany Maynard's family and her husband of, of a compassionate, love-filled transition that the family carries those memories of, of a peaceful transition. We compare those to the stories of horrific suffering that is absolutely not necessary. I would say our biggest allies that helped us break through were some of the active physicians in the physician community um, who helped the California Medical Association to remain neutral, um, which was really a significant uh, political achievement for our success with the bill. And I just have to shout out to those physicians who have stepped up, who have shown motivation to get educated, those that have engaged in training and teaching. Um, I'll just close, I know our time is limited. Uh, I think particularly in this time of the pandemic, where so many of us are dependent now on electronic communication, doctor's offices are holding appointments with patients on a, a whole range of medical issues and consultations using telemedicine. Um, the time is now for telemedicine to be accepted as an effective means, particularly for a terminally ill patient, to be able to have the consultations and the support necessary and not having to travel, um, as we learned the Whaley's having to travel three and a half hours often 
just to answer questions, um, we can and should be doing this through telemedicine. So we will be working always to improve access, to improve education and outreach. Uh, but again, I just want to thank Compassion and Choices, the Whaley's. Uh, I want to give a shout out to one of our big advocates, uh, Christine, um, Christy O'Donnell, who was a terminally ill patient, a former LA police officer um, who made multiple trips to Sacramento and was able to, to live and see the bill passed but was not able to be a beneficiary of that law. But like so many others, I think for those of you in other states, the engagement of terminally ill patients and their families, the engagement of practicing physicians, um, that's proven to be a winning combination. So I just urge the ongoing engagement with Compassion and Choices. We are part of a movement. The successes, we've been pioneers, but we still have work to do to get it right and to achieve the ultimate goal of compassionate options that are easily accessible while protecting the important safeguards. So again, thank you and I'll look forward to any questions at the appropriate time. And again, thanks to all of you for all of your work. Thank you so much, Senator Monning. Um, I'm so grateful for the work that you do and thank you for, for being with us today. Um, alrighty, let's get to some of these questions. So the first question I have, I live in Ohio, a state where there is no law regarding medical aid in dying. Is there an advocacy initiative in developing such legislation? And if so, how do I find it? That is a great question. Um, I do know in 2018, Senator Tavares, so I, I'm sorry if I butchered his name, um, he introduced legislation to authorize medical aid in dying in Ohio, and the bill was referred to the Health, Human Services, and Medicaid Committee. We have Compassion and Choices staff and advocacy communications working with individuals on the ground there to build capacity and set the groundwork for when legislation does come up in Ohio. So to, so to clarify what I said, you know, there, there was a bill in 2018, it went to the committee, you know, these bills have to get through lots of committees usually to be able to make it to the governor's desk and be signed. And that means so much grassroots organizing and grassroots efforts from volunteers and supporters, like Senator Monty said, storytelling, medical provider advocates, all of these, it's so huge and important to helping us pass laws. Um, and we have this in other states too, not just in Ohio. So I really encourage you to go to our website and to volunteer with Compassion and Choices and figure out how you can get plugged in so you can help authorize medical aid in dying in your state. Um, you can go to Compassion and Choices slash volunteer. All right, next question. Uh, I'm finding that many pharmacists are unwilling to fill medical aid in dying prescriptions. Are there any resources available as far as finding pharmacies that will honor the prescription? That is an excellent question. So um, I mentioned earlier in the presentation our doc to doc consultation line. So if you call or email our doc to doc line, we do keep a list of pharmacies that fill prescriptions. And right now the most common aid and dying medication has to be made in a compounding pharmacy. So if you, if you call or email our doc to doc line, we will get back to you as soon as possible and let you know which pharmacies in your area um, can fill medical aid and dying prescriptions. We also know that in some states, so for example, I know in um, California and Hawaii, prescriptions can be mailed to, the, to a patient. So um, it makes it a little bit easier if you don't have a pharmacy near you, and we can let you know that information if you reach out to us. Um, this question again is for me. Um, what kind of a doctor, what kind of doctor would you ask? your internist if you don't have a life-threatening condition at the present? Um, that's a great question. So if you're asking which doctor to talk to, um, it, it can be your primary care doctor. We often hear primary care physicians are often the ones who end up being the main physician for people. If you have an oncologist, you can ask them. Um, if, as long as they're, they're licensed in your state and they're qualified to give you the terminal diagnosis and prognosis of six months or less, that doctor can support you in the option of medical aid in dying. Um, and again, I, I encourage everybody to ask your doctor today. I've talked to my own doctor and he was, he was shocked because I'm not terminally ill 
And he never even thought about medical aid and dying. And he was very surprised when he realized how much I knew about medical aid and dying. But I'm, I'm so glad I had that conversation. And I know for some people, it's very, it's very awkward and scary to talk to their doctor about that. But I really encourage you not to be afraid. You are your own best advocate. And the sooner you can have those conversations, the better. Um, and then you can find out about all the end of life options that are available for you. Uh, all right, this question is for Tom. Tom, what would you ask the California legislature to change to help make the process easier? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, as far as asking the legislature, I, for, for me, it was the waiting period was um, excessive. Um, we, Christine was mentally capable a viable adult, she met the prognosis for six months or less, and to have to wait 15 days to do two verbal things was just jarring to, to us. Um, and as a period of unrest, right? Like what's happening during those 15 days? Um, you mentioned someone in Hawaii earlier that once they had the medication, it gave them peace of mind. Um, and I can speak to the truth of that is, uh, you don't have to take it right away once you have it. You don't even have to, once you have the prescription, you don't even have to fill it right away. Um, just that assurance that you have choices is a huge relief. And to lessen that waiting time um, would have been a, a huge help at the time. Thank you, Tom. Um, great question. All right, the next question is for Jess. Jess. What is driving opponents who object to medical aid in dying? Is it religion or something else? Sure. So there, there's a number of reasons why um, individuals oppose medical aid in dying. But I think at the top of the list, um, misinformation and misunderstanding, those are the, the main impediments. Um, increasing widespread understanding of the core eligibility requirements and also the safeguards in the law is something we all need to work to achieve. Um, but going back to, you know, whether it's motivated by religion, um, the majority of individual Catholics and other Christians do support medical aid in dying. However, the Catholic Church's opposition to medical aid in dying has been significant and impeded passage of legislation and implementation um, in authorized states. So we need to ensure that the values and priorities and religious freedom of individuals are not trumped um, by institutions. And then speaking from just uh, a experience with lawsuits, the claims that our opponents bring really vary by state, um, but they're usually grounded um, in the constitution and we do see a number of religious liberty claims being brought. Um, but I like to emphasize that um, participation um, in medical aid and dying is always voluntary, so. Thank you, Jess. Uh, the next question, my doctor has told me that he will not be part of the program. Um, and I just want to clarify, there is no program. This is, this is part of the standard of care. So um, any doctor in an authorized state who, like I said, can give the diagnosis and prognosis can support a patient, but they don't have to. Um, so anyway, so the question, my doctor has told me they will not participate, does Compassion and Choices provide a list of participating physicians in Washington, D.C.? That is a great question, and we get that question all the time. And um, the, the short answer is no, we do not keep a list of physicians, and there's a reason for it. So when Oregon first passed their law, we did kind of have a list of physicians, and what we found was, you know, it's so much easier for that main physician to refer a patient to someone else so they don't have to take on the responsibility of supporting that patient through that 13-step process that I outlined. And what happened was those physicians who agreed to support patients in medical aid and dying, some of them burned out because they did not go into medicine to just practice medical aid and dying. You know, medical aid and dying is not a specialized practice. It, is, it doesn't need to be and it, it shouldn't be. Um, and so instead of keeping a list of physicians, we work really hard to support physicians, support healthcare systems, so that physicians feel comfortable and are able to support their patients in this option, so that a patient doesn't have to find a whole new doctor 
to be able to have the option of medical aid in dying. They should be able to stick with their care team. And that's what we really strive to do. Now, that obviously doesn't always happen. And we do have a tool that we call the Find Care Tool. And I wanna make it very clear what the Find Care Tool does. If you go to our Find Care Tool, you can find it on our website. It lists healthcare system and hospice policies. And we ask three very simple questions. So you can find out what facilities near you let doctors prescribe, act as the main physician, what doctors can act as the second physician, and you can also find out which hospices allow their staff to be present when a person takes medical aid in dying, if that's something that you want. Now, um, we on our Find Care tool, you put in your zip code and you can say 10 miles, 50 miles, 100 miles from where you live so you can see where all the facilities are. And I do want to make it very clear that just because a facility is on the Find Care tool, it does not mean you are going to find a physician to support you at that facility, especially if it's a larger healthcare system that does not have an internal referral policy. Um, we do know that there have been patients who've gone to these facilities and um, unless their doctor refers them to a patient who will support them, um, they can fall through the cracks. So if you do go to a facility where you know the doctors are allowed to prescribe and your doctor says they won't support you, ask that doctor if they will refer you to another doctor who will. And, um, and you can always call our end of life consultation line and we can try to help you or your loved one navigate the process. Uh, our end of life consultation number, um, let's see, I just had it up here. It's 1-800-247-7421. Um, and if you call that line, leave a message, somebody will call you back and they can help, help you navigate the process. Um, next question. Uh, this one is for Senator Monning. Senator Monning, do you have to amend the California statute to allow for telemedicine in California? And if you do this, will it open up the statute for more amendments that might hurt the law? Is this a, a risk? Um, it's a great question. Uh, I'm going to be a little um, nuanced in my answer because uh, it's our belief that under the existing law, uh, working with our California Department of Public Health, uh, many of us believe they have authority and in interpretation of our existing law that could provide telemedicine contact. So our position is that we don't need new legislation uh, to include telemedicine as an option. Uh, that said, as we look at some of the other issues of the wait time uh, between consultations, et cetera, my guess is at some point in the future, there will be efforts um, to amend and, and part of the uh, litmus test, if you will, in assessment will be, um, is there a danger of, of having bad amendments or, or a wholesale assault on the law. So um, we'll proceed in an informed manner. We'll continue to work uh, with all legislators. And if I could just comment very briefly on kind of the, the opposition of the Catholic Church and some uh, Catholic hospitals, we also had a lot of faith leaders very supportive in our efforts to pass the law. Um, a very strong letter from uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu from South Africa to Jerry Brown that was one of the influential uh, uh, religious voices that Governor Brown listened to. And as you said, uh, among practicing Catholics, majorities support the option being available to a terminally ill patient. We did reach out to the Archbishop uh, in California. We engaged, we invited their inputs on safeguards, realizing they would continue to oppose a law. Uh, but I think there's a way to maybe mitigate the strength of opposition by being inclusive um, as much as possible. And then just finally, I would point out um, the experience that that Tom and Christine had in San Luis Obispo County in her op-ed while they had to go to extraordinary efforts to employ the law to their benefit. Uh, their efforts have led to more outreach in that area and identifying physicians willing to participate. So again, 
they were really the pioneers and had to go to extraordinary efforts. Um, but I know there's now been trainings that have been coordinated um, and supported by compassion and choices. And so it does take time. And I think this movement will necessarily only grow because again, we're talking about fundamental human rights, our track record, no abuses, no accidents, no um, uh, family members opposing. It's It's been a law that with its safeguards, we've heard We've gotten handwritten notes from family members thanking us for our work to make this option available to loved ones. Um, and so I think time is on our side. It will only continue to grow as a respected, safe, uh, and effective human right. Thank you, Senator Monning. Um, and that is true. There are now more doctors who will support patients in medical aid and dying in San Luis Obispo, thanks to Christine's advocacy and Tom's continued advocacy. So it's, you know, we are making inroads. And um, I also wanted to point out that telemedicine, there, the laws are a little bit different in each state. California law already permits the use of telehealth when providing medical services to support medical aid and dying. I've gotten permission from Kaiser Northern California and the City of Hope to share their policy, which, which during the pandemic, they can do all medical aid and dying consultations via telemedicine if the doctor feels comfortable doing that. And I know in other states, doctors are using telemedicine to support patients in those medical aid and dying consultations um, even before the pandemic. Um, so, you know, it depends on the state, but it is a possibility. Uh, next question. Our son has ALS and is ready for hospice. He takes nutrition through a feeding tube. Are you working to address his inability to be able to use medical aid in dying? First of all, um, I am sorry to hear about your son. Um, and I, I want to let you know that actually this is a common misconception that individuals with degenerative diseases do not qualify for medical aid in dying, but actually they do. And um, ALS is, it's the second most common um, terminal illness that people have that choose the option of medical aid in dying. So your son, um, if they get that six month diagnosis, which it sounds like he may be, he may have since he's ready for hospice, as long as he is able to take the medication through his feeding tube and he's the one to um, push the, the plunger for his feeding tube, uh, then that's considered self-ingestion and he can have the option of medical aid in dying. I know some patients also use an anal catheter and again as long as it's the patient and they're able to to push the plunger for the anal catheter, they are doing it themselves voluntarily. They meet all the other, they're qualified, they meet all the other requirements. Um, this is an option for them. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, the next one is how long does the process typically typically take in the states which have passed the laws? Is it incredibly difficult to find doctors? So I will say when a state first passes an aid in dying law, it can be very difficult because to find a doctor um, because a lot of doctors are unaware of the law. And again, that's why we, we work so hard to, to educate them and let them know about it. Um, but then it, it kind of, it just depends on where you live. So um, if you live in a rural area where your closest healthcare system is a, a Catholic healthcare system that doesn't practice evidence-based medicine, then it can be a lot more difficult to find a doctor. Um, but if you live somewhere where there's, you know, a Kaiser or another health system that is um, secular and has a good policy, then it's much easier to find a supportive doctor. Um, usually it takes about four to six weeks depending, uh, but again, that's why it's important to have these conversations before you get sick. Um, and unfortunately, I just realized we're almost out of time. There's one minute left. And um, I, I wanna thank everyone so much. I wanted to share my screen one more time, just very quickly to, to go over the last few resources that we have. And I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of the questions. Um, so just very quickly, if you go to our website, we have a ton of resources. Um, you can email us at eolc at compassionandchoices.org. You can also always email us if you can't find what you're looking for on the website, email info, I-N-F-O, at compassionandchoices.org, and your email will be directed to the correct staff person, and they will get in touch with you right away um, and help you find what you're looking for. Uh, we have some upcoming webinars. There's one on May 26th. 
um, ensuring all Americans are prepared for the inevitability of end of life. On June 2nd, you know, we've been talking about telemedicine. Um, we're going to have a webinar on opportunities to expand telehealth use amid the COVID-19 pandemic, and we're planning more webinars. This is a series that we're going to continue doing. Um, and you can watch previous webinars that we've done on our website. We've had a lot of great and interesting topics and speakers, so I, I encourage you to check that out and share them with your friends and family. Um, and then you can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Um, so thank you all so much. I hope that this was a useful webinar for you, and thank you for the great work that you do. We really are all stronger together. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.